Bob's is what I'm doing. So. Yeah, the Bob, yeah. Yeah, B A D, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's where I met Bob. So, Man. I mean, that's like that. So, that's a pretty crazy week mm -hmm. or two. For when sure. When you're 16. <laughs> oh my God. The way you just throw that out there, like it's oh yeah, I was sixteen. It's no, I mean yeah. I was blessed. To, like I, just, I was struggling to get my driver's license at sixteen, Charlie. <laughs> oh I was struggling not to be pulled over driving illegally. Welcome back to another episode of Sam Sessions. We're back here in the Acoustic A Room of South Austin Music. Very, very special day today, as always, but you know, this one's gotta be up top. You got the world's worst interviewer right here and to my right, <laughs> a long time friend, Charlie Sexton. How you doing, man? I'm good. Doing good? Your music career is like insane. I mean, you, your discography, I mean, the people you've played with, you know, the amount of time you spent playing is like mind blowing. It's awesome. Um, and it's funny when I know you from the shop and like most of the time I interact with you, I'm at work, you know, it's like a day of work. And then I start doing all this research for you. And of course I knew things before, but in the research I was like, man, I might be a little starstruck to do this interview, <laughs> even though I've known this guy before, you know? Well, yeah, I've known you most of your life. I uh huh. Think. Uh huh. So, so but, uh, there's been another guy coming in the shop. Yeah. But, in the, and I, of course Which I, I am, by the way. Sure. Sure. <laughs> sure. But like I said, you know, I, I knew about your career, but when you start researching someone, you certainly find things you didn't know before. And yeah, I was, I was easy to say I was blown away. Um, and I'm going to live up to that tagline real quick. Cause you do have this amazing, uh, musical career, but Dude, I got to talk about your acting a little bit to start mm -hmm. off. Um, I saw you were in Thelma and Louise. Yeah. How was that? Uh, let me let me start by saying, how did you get into acting? Uh, well, I always appreciated film, and I mm -hmm. like that. I never had the much opportunity to to uh, um, you know study it or what have you. Right. And, and then I accidentally moved to California for five years. <laughs> Which is what happened. I, mean, I went to make a record, just didn't leave for five years. Yeah, yeah. The irony is, is I never. That's when Thelma Louise occurred. Right. But I never got into class or anything when I was living in Los Angeles. It was after I moved back mm. uh, here to Austin. Acting class. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, uh, just the lay of the land, so to speak. When I moved back to Austin, mm -hmm. suddenly I had like an extra four hours a day. Yeah, because it just it didn't. It wasn't as difficult to get around at that point, right? You know, to do what you got to do in the daily. So anyway, then I, I started taking classes and working my way up through different uh, uh, coaches and what have. Yeah. And so that's where that kind of really started. Thelma Louise did happen when um, uh, you were in, I was in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about that is that at the time we would. Uh, you know, we were doing it. It was a kind of the the heat of when like uh, soundtracks for film. Okay. You know, and I was on uh, Universal, and so they were doing the the uh, woman there, Kathy Nelson, was like the queen of soundtracks. She did like all the really great soundtracks. Yeah. And so uh, we were always doing various things, you know, music for film, like you know, and so uh, the Thelma and Louise thing. I was speaking to her one day. She's like, "Hey, listen, there's a few things going on." I said, "What's up?" She's like, "Well, just." There's an old Gibson film. They went and you cut a track for him. I'm like, okay, all right. Well, that, that sounds like that'd be fun. You know, yeah. Blah blah blah. And so she named off three things, and one of the things she says, "Oh, and Ridley Scott." I knew Ridley's brother Tony, because I'd already done uh, work for him mm -hmm. uh, for Beverly Hills Cop. What, did he do that one? Yeah, I think he did, and something else as well. Okay. So uh, she said Ridley's doing this film. And he wants you to actually perform. He wants you to do some songs for it. He wants you to be in the film performing. I was like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, what do you mean? I go, well, because it never really plays. Whenever you see a band in a film, normally it's just kind of, you know, they'll do the music uh, afterwards. Yeah. So it's like a bad sync and it just looks very false. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, no, he really wants you to do it. And I think it's something that's like, yeah, I don't want to do that because it always looks bad. Right. She goes, well, will you at least have a meeting with Ridley? I said, of course we'll have a meeting with Ridley. So I went for the meeting with Ridley, and um, uh, 
he wasn't having it. As far as he was concerned, I was doing any, uh, you know, <laughs> any way I told him that I wasn't going to do it, he yeah. wasn't having it. He was just like, almost as if he didn't hear me. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, so we'll be starting next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, that, 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 he just, yeah. Yeah. No matter just, what protest I made, he was not having it. You had so. to do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, it was really not even a conversation. Um, <laughs> There's a fly. Mr. Miyagi over here. <laughs> All right, sorry. Yeah, sure, there was. There was a fly. Yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing about that day was that so it came to the day when we were going to do the the uh, shoot, and it was really like the first week of Thelma Louise. The mm -hmm. So it was like there was nobody, but I think Gina Davis and uh, Susan Sarandon were on uh, on site, right. ready to shoot something. But they were setting up that whole bar scene. So anyway. We, you know, of course, like a film, we got to be there at five thirty in the morning, and it's oh. me and some of my musician friends, mm -hmm. kind of like dressed like cowboys when they weren't. But <laughs> and um, so the f the funny story about that day was that really had given given us his trailer to hang out in because it was of course delayed, so we're just like hanging around. And at one point, he came to check in and said, "Hey, man, I'm sorry for the delay. There's still lighting and setting up everything." I said, no, "That's no problem." Yeah. And we talked for a minute, and then he kind of stepped away. And he was probably about 40 feet from me, and his producer walked up, and he was looking at me. We were got there early in the morning. We we're in Ridley's trailer, me and the band that I put together were just my friends, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, he came to check on us, you know, to say hello. He said, oh, sorry, it's taking so long. This will set up the scene. I said, it's fine, you know. Mm -hmm. And then he stepped away, about 40 feet away, and his uh, producer, Mimi, was standing next to him. And he kind of gave me that, like, where he's looking through you thing. And he was looking at me very strangely. And I was like, what's going on, really? And he's like, he goes, well, it's funny. You have to remember, this is the first day or first week of filming. Yeah, yeah. He goes, now that I see you in front of me, there's this part that we haven't cast yet. And you'd be perfect for it. And so I was just talking to Mimi, but I don't think we can make it work in the storyline how you're playing in the bar and then your character would show up later. Yeah. I don't know if we can make it work. But, wow. I was like, okay. Guess what the part was? What? The Brad Pitt part. No <laughs> shit. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, then Brad Pitt took it then, huh? That was actually the thing that really yeah. set Brad up because Brad had been around for quite some time. And just Damn. Little things. That was like his breakout Breakout role? role? Yeah. Wow, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it, you know? yeah, so you almost, basically you almost took Brad Pitt's career from him, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, that's the, if you really want to go into that whole joke part, it's like, yeah, well, I wouldn't be married to Angelina Jolie, I would have <laughs> 12 children, you know. No. Oh, that's, yeah. that's, that is insane, though. Did you meet Brad Pitt at all on that set? No, because he was a day player. Yeah. For the most part, and that, that was like, you know, a month or two later, mm -hmm. the filming. I don't think I've ever met Brad Pitt, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a one of the few names you probably haven't met. One of the big names that I would know. Um, yeah, the reason why I brought up your whole acting career is because your music career is enough for a hundred people. The things you've done is insane. <laughs> hundred people. <That's> <laughs> well, look, like... I caught your fly in my coffee. Oh no! Did you really? <laughs> Yeah, look. Well, at least he got him, man. Well, you know, right, let's close up shop here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I mean, it kind of blew my mind when I was uh, looking through your stuff. I mean, you've been in like 10 plus movies, right? Um, I don't think that many. Maybe less than that. Well, definitely less, less than that. Less than 10? There's a bunch of indie stuff. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Do you enjoy acting or is this something you kind of just did on the side? Oh, no, I, I mean, I really, you know, I truly enjoy it. And that's what happened when I started going to class was just the whole, the work of it, that's mm -hmm. really the... So, getting into the music side of things now, um, I mean, there's so many places to go, it's it's hard to know where to start. Uh, I guess, really, like, the best place to start would be, was your first show at Continental Club when you were 12? Is this is that true? That's partially true. My first, yeah, the first gig that I played was on my brother's birthday, which is the day before my birthday. Okay. So it was the next day I turned 11. Wow. But it was a condom club, yeah. Yeah. So it was your 11th birthday? The day before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. See, that's insane. I, I thought it might have been your 12th. 
Yeah, so... By the end of the night, it was my birthday, you know? Uh-huh, there you go, right there at midnight, <laughs> yeah. So I saw so many things that, uh, you know, it's almost like I'm gonna have to hear it from you to, like, really believe it. Um, so, you um, know, that, that being the first one, that you played Continental at age 11 yeah. for your brother's birthday. And was Stevie there as well? Oh, Stevie wasn't there that night. Not that night? No. Okay. Yeah, I talked to uh, uh, Danny Crooks, who was the uh, owner of Steamboat, you of know, Sean's Bob's, yeah. 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 That, was, that was one of the little tidbits he gave me. Um, and you played at Steamboat back in the day as well, right? Oh, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, was, how was that uh, venue for you? It was, I mean, it was sort of like a, you know, it was a, Steamboat was a great club. It was like a real sort of like family vibe over there. Mm -hmm. A lot of bands came out of there and, uh, you know, Danny was great. I mean, oddly enough, the first time I played, well, I don't know it was the first time, but I played with Stevie at Steamboat, I think before Danny was really around. Yeah. Um, because uh, we grew up knowing Stevie and... Uh, I mean, back then, I mean, no one was really at the gigs. Yeah. Didn't really cared. <laughs> um, so I remember, but he would play a lot in San Marcos. At one point, we were living in Wimberley. Okay. So every week, we, my brother and I would go there. Right. And play with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or actually, that's really not how it worked, because usually he'd see me come, and he'd just go, he'd call me up. So I think it was one of the, actually, that didn't really happen. Instead of Stevie Vaughan in Double Trouble, it'd be Little Charlie in Double Trouble, you know? <laughs> and that's where I met Tommy Chan, was at Steamboat. Okay. Stevie was playing one night, and it was like 1.30 or something, he saw me. He's like, hey, come on up. Yeah, yeah. So he handed me his guitar. And, and you were more in your, like, uh, like kind of in your 20s, like early, early 20s at that time? No, I was 12 years old. Oh, Jesus 11, Christ. 12, yeah. So what was like, did you go to school too? Like, yeah, uh, school. Yeah. yeah. Well, you slept to, through it the whole time? How did I how? went to school up to a point. Yeah, okay. And basically, I left home. And then um, I, essentially what happened was I kind of was looking down the line. And got real serious about it, like, oh, I gotta, because uh, the objective was to make records. That's mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. Right. I mean, play, play shows as well. But, so uh, yeah, by the time I was like 13, yeah. I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm not going to be going, you know, I don't think I'm going to be at UT anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you were at night school, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so how early, I know you started, you know, playing those shows at 11, 12, 13 years old, but how early did you start finding yourself in Austin clubs? Oh, that was from the, I mean, because we moved here, uh, I started school here, so I was about five years old. So within that first year we would be going to you know concerts at the armadillo or just everything did they allow five-year-olds in, in the clubs back then or did you just have the Sick. well it was my mother yeah we couldn't afford a babysitter so uh-huh um and you know texas is always like a different usually if you had a parent with you or something mm -hmm. and back then it was all a bunch of hippies anyway so yeah yeah there were kids running around here and there you know. gotcha gotcha i just it's hard for me to imagine being exposed to kind of like the club scene at that early of an age you know i always thought i was like a black sheep because i started going out when i was like 16 17 but for you at that time you were like a veteran on the scene yeah i mean that's yeah that was the least of what i was exposed to <laughs> <laughs> but no i kind of grew up in you know, watching bands and bars and yeah, you know, what have you. Yeah. So, do you attribute most of your early life being spent in those kind of scenes for the way that you've spent your, you know, rest of your life as a career in music? Do you think you would have found music regardless, or there's a fair chance of that? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, but that definitely helped to be able to to see all the amazing people that I got to see. Yeah. As a little kid. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. How do you feel about like? Uh, I'm sure you still spend time around Continental Club. How do you feel about like how it was back then versus now? Has it changed like unrecognizably, or uh, is there still a piece of old Austin there? Oh, it's there. I mean, yeah. th that that's a loaded question because like that first time I played there, and so that would have been like 1979 or 80. Mm -hmm. um, I played with this band called the Bizarros, and they were the they were the essentially the band that got music back in the Continental because mm -hmm. it was basically like a bar fly, really funky place. Yeah. And they just convinced whoever owned the place or ran the place, hey, can we come play? He goes, well, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> he was like, well, was, you know, everyone's here at 1130 beating on the door to come in and drink. Yeah. And then usually by the, you know, the evening, they're pretty... 
they got there. They're gone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, Steve Warheimer, who owns it and has owned it for, I don't know, you know how long now, since 90-something. Yeah. 89. Uh, I mean, he did a great job because he, because it was like shag carpet, beer soaked, and it was, it was funky. Yeah. It was really funky. Needed a little bit of a renovation. To say the least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad he was able to do that. So, no, and he's, he's kept that. I mean, I, actually, I always uh, sing Steve's praises because the Continental and now we have Sea Boys and just everything he does is really mm -hmm. out of love for the town. And uh, there's right. actually a guitar shop upstairs. Oh, no shit? That's where the gallery is. Oh, I never heard that. Yeah. It was a place called One World. And it was like one of the early vintage, you know. Yeah. Uh, vintage shops in town. Which is funny to say because... Now it's called vintage. It used to be used guitars. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember people using the word vintage. Because yeah. yeah, they were just, yeah, used guitars back then. Well, I mean, the, down the block here, where Ray Hennings was, which was like, mm -hmm. you know, famous. Oh, yeah. Um, and you go in, and Ray was a Fender dealer, so we'd have like all, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. once he'd order, and once he'd come in. And, but that's like, that's where Stevie got his main strat over there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, uh, for like, probably like four dollars or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, it was so, just used guitars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Now it's vintage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, bringing up Stevie again, how much time did you spend around him back in the day? Did you see him quite often? Was it every? Yeah, yeah I mean, I saw he baby this. You know, there's a famous story. He babysat us one day, mm -hmm. where my mom dropped us off at his house. He played his records for a few hours and just hung out because he was like really, he was so sweet and real childlike in a way too. He just getting yeah. all excited, you know. Yeah. And uh, he really babysat you. Well, we sat in his living room listening to records for yeah two hours. <laughs> but we knew Stevie, and we would. I mean, like I had mentioned before, we were living in Wimberley, which is you know forty minutes away. Mm -hmm. And he would play at San Marcos every Wednesday or whatever it was. There yeah. was never anybody there. Yeah. It was like us and maybe four other people. So that became that was closer than coming to Austin during wow. the week. So we'd go over there and, and get him play, you know. Yeah. So I knew Stevie. Um, we both. It's funny our trajectories. You know, I ended up doing what I did. He ended up doing what he did. So we didn't see each other for years because mm -hmm. he'd be on tour and I'd be on tour, what have you. Yeah. But those early days, because I knew Stevie before I knew Jimmy. Okay. And then so. You know, he was he was just the sweetest guy, Stevie. He really was. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. So uh, I hear countless stories about Stevie working here, but definitely never one about how he was babysat one time. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah, that's well, that's there wasn't good. much baby to it. Like I said, yeah, mostly yeah. just like check out this record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. So and then uh, going forward a little bit, about what age were you when you were on tour with uh, David Bowie and opening up for him? Well, that's that's actually some of that's folklore because I was never like literally on tour with him or right. opening. When I was living in um, Los Angeles by accident, <laughs> by your accident, a really, really, really dear friend of mine is a photographer mm -hmm. named Greg, and uh, he just he shot everybody, knew everybody, mm. and um, he was uh, he was working with David. And they were friends, and he just rang me one day. He goes, "Hey, listen, David's, you know, here. And he wants to meet you. Come over." I said, "Okay." Yeah. So I went to Greg's house. They were shooting something or whatever it was. And how much had you heard about David Bowie before you went to go meet him for the first time? I was already. I mean, I wasn't like um, fanatical about him. Right. But I was. I mean, I was aware. Of, I was listening to his records. I had okay. listened to all the records. Okay. But I mean, I remember being a kid, like nine years old, before I was actually knew how to play. And I had a little uh, uh, AM FM radio. It looked like a spaceship or UFO. Yeah. And I would just listen to the radio. I didn't have that many records. So. And I remember the ad for uh, Scary Monsters when it came out on the radio. Scary Monsters, you know. Yeah. Like the classic FM radio. Voice. DJ voice. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because I believe he was coming on tour, is what it was. Interesting. 
So yeah, I wasn't fanatical about him at that point. I definitely was a uh, fan and appreciated what he did. Okay. And so, then we met. It was just like immediately we were just like fast friends. And so before I knew it, he was in uh, Los Angeles at the time, uh, finishing a record. So we were just like going to dinner every other night. You know, like what are you doing? I'm like nothing. Let's go to Korea then. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so, to answer the question properly. Um, while he was there, he'd come by my house one day. He rang me up and he's like, hey, what are you doing? Or maybe we work on a song. I said, okay. So he came to my house and we kind of fooled around with the song idea mm -hmm. for a couple hours. And then, uh, then he had to go do something, so we split. And then um, he finished that record he was working on. He went back to wherever he was and he would randomly call me like in the middle of the night from like Switzerland or something. And then he rang me one point, he goes, hey, he goes, I'm gonna be down in your home state. We're, the tour's going to Texas. I was like, oh, cool. He goes, you should, you should come down, we'll work on the song again. We'll work on the song, come down. I said, okay. So I flew down to uh, Houston mm -hmm. and met up with the tour. And then we, that night after the show, we flew to Dallas. And um, I think, yeah, he had me get up on stage in Dallas. Yeah. That's what it was. Wow. And then, the next day, the tour went to Los Angeles, so I went home, they flew there. And then uh, he had a show in Los Angeles uh, a couple of days later, and um, my friend Carmine Rojas, who plays with him, said, I think David's gonna ask you to come to Australia, because the tour was going to Australia to film like one of those ABC Friday night concert specials. Mm -hmm. And he did, he said, you wanna come to Australia and be my special guest on the TV the thing? I was like, yeah. <laughs> God. So that's what I did. I went there. It's crazy because it's like. So, I mean, I did like, you know, 10 shows with him. Yeah. Yeah. That's enough. At the most. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Not even that. But just that's as a, get up to a special guest because they, mm -hmm. you know. It's nuts because, like, I, I'm tempted to ask if you were, like, nervous for those shows, but it seems that you were exposed to playing on a stage so early that that never would have really been a thing for you. Did you get nerves? Yeah, you get nerves. I mean, actually, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, um, I get more uncomfortable than nerves. Like, really? That's, I mean, that still happens. If I have to stand around, like I don't put the suit on or whatever yeah. before I go on. It's just almost like this, you know. Uh-huh. If I gotta like stand around and get nervous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? If you have the time for it, then it'll happen. Or just the, yeah, just the, you know. How long were you uh, the guitarist for Bob Dylan for? Uh, let's see. I'm, I started playing with Bob because I was in and out um, okay. in 1999. Yeah. That was when I first started working with him. I was there for three years, roughly. Wow. Three, and then I quit for six when my kid was really young. And then I went back for another however long. Mm -hmm. and then I quit again. And then they, then I went back a third time. So it was a bit off and on for a while? Yeah, over from up until really last year. I mean, well, yeah. I guess the last thing we've done together was his last record. Okay, gotcha. And so how did you come into contact with him? <laughs> uh, oh, okay, I'll condense this story. Um, I mentioned before that there was a lot of like the film work mm -hmm. that would be done when I was on Universal MCA. And at one point, actually it was like, it was right after I got signed. It was almost the first real job. Yeah. I did before I made my first record was uh, Ron Wood was uh, doing the music for this, uh, uh, sorry, not Sh Sean, Chris Penn film called Wildlife. And they said, hey, Ron Wood's doing a bunch of music for this film. We want you to go to, to New York and sing and play on this tune, one of the tunes. So, okay, fine. So I did. So I go to New York, me and Wayne Nagel, my old cohort, you know, and uh, we'd heard like, oh, maybe so-and-so's going to show up, maybe someone's going to, you know, and then so I go, I meet Woody, we're at the studio, and then here he comes, here comes Keith, I'm like, oh, hey, you know, so that's where I met Keith, mm -hmm. so the same day I met Woody, I met Keith, and then Woody and I hit it off well, and he asked me to hang around. He's like, I'm working on a solo record. Can I want you to stick around and, and let's record? I said, okay. Um, so I ended up staying with Woody for like a week or two. 
Jeez. And then while I was, eventually the next week we went into the studio, and one night he said, hey, uh, Bob's gonna come by tonight. And I didn't really snap to what he was talking about. It was just Bob from Jersey or, you know. Yeah. Well, at midnight that night, <laughs> before I know it, there's Bob Dylan. So. Yeah, the Bob, yeah. Yeah, the, <laughs> A, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, that's where I met Bob. So, Man. I mean, that's like that, so that's a pretty crazy week mm -hmm. or two. For when sure. When you're 16. <laughs> oh my God. The way you just throw that out there, like it's oh yeah, I was sixteen. It's no, I mean yeah. I was blessed. To, like I, just, I was struggling to get my driver's license at sixteen, Charlie. <laughs> oh I was struggling not to be pulled over driving illegally. Still, <laughs> <laughs> became a very good driver though. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. It's yeah, it's nuts. Um, are there any shows that you did with Bob that really stick out above the rest, or maybe just any moment outside of the the music that stuck out a lot to you? Oh, there's so many moments. There's so many. I mean, I spent over the since '99. Yeah. A lot of my life has been spent. Mm -hmm. You know. With him. For the most part, yeah. Yeah, I was born in '99, so it's about 23 years. Yeah. Is can you can you give us one that might stick? Well, out? Well, I mean, you said any gigs. I mean, I, I mean. The way I look at things are a little different. It's like, oh, Roy, you know, Albert Hall. We did that a few times, and that uh -huh. was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to me, one of the more wild shows was when we played in, uh, we, had, we were on tour in Italy, and we'd gone down to, like, uh, Sicily. I'm pretty sure it's where, but anyway, the, the volcano was going off. So we were playing this gig, and, like, two weeks before we were actually going to do that show, there was, like, it had erupted, and they were, like, you know, closing down airports and you know volcanic ash is flying around <laughs> how close is this volcano to where you were well i'm going to get to that part and so they're like okay everything's gonna be fine it's kind of chilling out you know so we end up going there's the last show of that tour so we fly into the island you know we go to the gig and it's it's literally a roman greek outdoor kind of amphitheater thing this yeah. little that's, I mean, it's got fallen down pillars. I mean, it's literally Roman Greek. It's like, like a Colosseum type deal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, but not fancy. It's just on the top of this hill, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. or, you know, little mountain foothills or whatever. But, you know, like the sea's there, the volcano's over there. And so we start doing a sound check and you hear like, it's like, because it's about to go off again. And so uh, we do the gig. And it's like during the gig, you can feel like rumbling. <laughs> and we finished the gig and we were meant to like leave the following day, like in the evening. But we finished the gig, we go, we got to get out of here because it's going off. So we get in the vans, we go down to the hotel we were staying at, pack the bags, jump in the van, and we're driving to the airport. So it's like, you know, one in the morning at this point or something. Yeah. And we're, we have to go drive to the airport, we have to drive around the volcano. Like on the high, it's like a, it's like a ring road. You know? <laughs> but as we're driving, it's like dark, and we're like, oh, we, you know, just, and we don't know if we're gonna actually be able to get out. Uh -huh. You know, and so, but we're driving around, like literally see lava, river of lava coming down the volcano. <laughs> Holy! It was, you know, it hadn't gone all the way off again, but it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's rock star shit right there. I don't know about rock star. But... <laughs> I mean, I mean, playing through a volcanic eruption. Yeah, that's, that's a crazy. Wild one, so, you know. Yeah, that's crazy. So, uh, were you like, was it a struggle getting off the yeah. island, or? No, we got on the plane. Yeah. I mean, but I think they were because they were gonna. The reason we were gone, they were probably gonna close the airport. That uh huh. Morning. Uh huh. So that we got off somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a, a good one to tell. That's insane. I haven't. Uh, I've never heard anything like that before. So you traveled all over the world doing music. Um, and you know, through volcanoes, that's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, you have like a, a favorite place? Um, not necessarily like because of the shows you did there, but just a favorite place to hang out. Um, that's overseas that kind of sticks out to you. I love Australia. I've always loved Australia. Yeah. What's special about that place? Well, I had some really good friends there. Um, <clears throat> I spent quite some uh, time there. Mm -hmm. I mean, because that's actually. I think. Yeah, the first time I went was with David. Which oh, was, really? Because he that uh, that concert was filmed in Sydney, 
So I was there for like over two weeks. Yeah. At that point, and I played on uh, this friend of mine, Jimmy Barnes, is like a big rock and roll Australian artist. I okay. played on his record. So while I was there with David, I ended up seeing Jimmy again. Yeah, yeah. And there was like these three years in a row. I went there every year at the same time. First started with David, then went back to play with Jimmy again the mm -hmm. next year. And then the following year, I went back and spent, you know, probably two to three months there. Wow. Working with Jimmy. Yeah. What's the best food out there? Uh, well, seafood's great there. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, like the, um, yeah, it's really good. Seafood's really good there. Gotcha. Um, it, it's all good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, we, we connected there, and then he kind of grew up between Texas and California, and then at some point he moved back here. And um, how the Angels essentially started was Stevie and Jimmy had just done the family style record. And so there was going to be a tour, but it was going to be like a hiatus for Double Trouble. Mm. So Chris and I, who I've known forever through Stevie, mm -hmm. uh, Whipper, Chris Whipper Lathan, um, <laughs> he, uh, we had talked about it. He goes, hey man, because I was at the Arsenal Rehearsal Complex at the studios after I moved back. Mm. He goes, hey, we're going to be around, man. Maybe we should do like a gig because Doyle was back in town. I'm like, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah, let's, maybe we'll get together and play or do something. I'm like, okay, fine. Um, so we actually talked about that. And then um, I, we actually had like a little gig at the Continental booked. Oh, wow. Um, just for fun. And then before we did it is when the, uh, the crash occurred and Stevie was killed. So... Mm. Didn't do the gig. And then, um, so I was just at my little studio working every day for like, you know, I just go there and work for like 14 hours a day. And uh, eventually, Chris kind of came, you know, out and was kind of playing down there at the rehearsal place. Mm -hmm. And we talked about it like, man, we should do something, you know. And then eventually, uh, I said, we should do something because they needed to, I, I felt, I said, this will be good if we can get out and just play. Cause that's what Chris had been with Stevie since the beginning. Yeah. So that's how it started. It's like, let's just have a gig. Just, you know, get you guys out of the house. And, you know, and so I think we, we booked a gig, but then there was already a rumor that we were a band, but before there was actually a band, then we did a gig with Robert Cray opening up. Wow. And, uh, but we hadn't actually done a gig or rehearsed anything. So. Uh-huh. It was a bit of a, you know, farce. <laughs> so we did the gig. We did the one little gig, and then immediately there was uh, interest um, mm -hmm. from like labels for the band. So uh, ultimately, um, at that point, I was writing what was going to be my next record, and uh, but ultimately, I felt it was important for my friends Chris and Tommy. Mm -hmm. So let's do this. You know, get you guys playing again. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so that's what we did. So then move into uh, Charlie Sexton and Sex Tech. Mm -hmm. That was, um, who, who was all involved with that group? That was, essentially what that was, was that was the record I was writing when we did the Archangels. Really? I was okay. like halfway through writing that okay. record. That band was um, uh, essentially myself, Michael Ramos, who I'd known for years and played with. George Reef on bass, Rafael Gallo on drums, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Susan Vales ended up in the band. Yeah. Uh, on the tour, playing violin. How long were you guys on tour for? Uh, we toured like for, you know, the record came out, we toured for a few months, what have you, and then went into uh, uh, working on it. Then my brother, because my brother was on that record, and mm -hmm. then he kind of joined the band. And we started writing and working on uh, new material. Yeah. And then that all became a horror story of dealing with labels and. Oh, yeah. Or not dealing with labels or mm -hmm. getting a label and then that label folding, you know, whatever. Right, so. right. So, having all the experience you do, would you, do you have any advice for someone who's trying to break into the scene as far as dealing with labels? Do you have any, like, if you could kind of put it into, like, one word of advice? What would you say? Uh, not really, because anyone that's really young breaking into it, they don't have that. They don't really know what that was, mm. and so which is a good thing in some ways, because it's 
you're you're working uh, within how things happen these days, where you just yeah. make music and you put it out, or you figure out, you know, the mm-hmm. whole the old mold, so to speak, is really the old mold. Yeah. And there's, yeah. Frag- there's fragments of that still existing, but. Uh, Charlie, you're like a incredible multi instrumentalist. Kind of. I mean, uh, what instruments do you not play? All of them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know about that because my dad was telling me a story when we did the uh, mural party here. Uh-huh. Uh, I think it was a mandocello you picked up and played. Uh, do that or bazooki, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, those are basically the almost same thing. Yeah, and uh, those are kind of out there instruments. Um, what? Where do you find the ability to play those instruments that most other people wouldn't really go near? Well, if you if you go through certain genres of music, then you you know there's certain instruments that are attributed to those mm-hmm. styles or genres. Uh, that's what's great about I was just talking to your, your father the other day because he's always had this corner of weirdness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm probably one of the people that spends more time in the corner of weirdness than. Yeah the other side where everybody else is. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's been great because, um, you know, it's like, oh, I got this thing coming in and I'll just like, I want something that doesn't sound like a guitar. Mm-hmm. Or um, some bazooki or a, you know, bukwela or a whatever. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just all And he's those... usually got it. Yeah. You know, he's got some version of it here. I'm like, there it is, you know. So, I mean... But like, break it down for me. Do you do you go to someone to learn like kind of the basics of playing that instrument? Does it come naturally? No. Do you know it from the other ones you've already learned? Well, th- there. I think it's fair to say. I mean, there's. I mean, there's people that are like if someone plays one instrument their whole life, and they're really talented, they will. You know, get close to mastering that instrument. Right. So that's that part of it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, say, oh, I play bazooki. It's like, well, like. Are you from Greece and you actually play the bazooki? You know, cause yeah. that's a that even that's an interesting example because it's more common for it to be tuned like a mandolin okay. and use an Irish way opposed to the Greek way, you know, mm-hmm. which is a different tuning. So anyway, the point I'm making is that you know putting yourself uh, on an instrument that's not you're not so familiar with or this you know. It, you, you'll make mistakes or you'll learn things or you're, you're kind of like, it's like going somewhere that you've never been. Mm-hmm. And so if you just keep walking on the same street, you're not going to notice things because you're just sort of like, you've seen it, you know it's there. Mm-hmm. And so it's yeah. a lot like that. Interesting. It's like, you know, you're like, wow, look at that. You know? Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's helpful at times. And plus it, a lot of it for me has to do with, since um, I've always kind of like heard things in a more... Uh, uh, a full picture of things okay. sonically or yeah. texturally it's like I need something that does this what's what what makes that sound you know mm-hmm. so then or you get an instrument you just start fooling with it and you'll be like oh this is cool you know and it'll inspire ideas you know yeah alright so for the next part of the show uh, gonna do some rapid fire questions uh, kind of a a way to get to know you a little bit outside of music. Get a bring in like a spotlight? <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. KGB cell? Uh... <laughs> We're not seeing the question here. You like big venues or small venues? I probably like the the in-between. In-between? I mean, there's a, you know, a little, you know, cool, sweaty, funky club's cool. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, like a nice big theater or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely prefer that to like the big, you know, one of those 60,000 people or something. <laughs> yeah. Or whatever, you know. Would you rather be the first person alive or the last? Probably not the last. Probably not the last? Yeah. Yeah, got you. But I mean, if you're the last person, you got all the instruments in the world, you know? Yeah, well, well the first I don't know go. what good that's going to do you, but... <laughs> hey, fight or flight. Oh, well, that's, that's... Like, you know, if something's happening, you have the natural response of either run or, or, or fight. Which one, which one would you choose or which one do you tend to go to? Well, it depends what... On the situation? Yeah. Okay, let's say... Uh, you're walking with your wife down the street and a mugger's coming at Fight. you. Fight? Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. If your wife's in heels, you might as well, because you're not going to be able to run too fast. Of course. Give me one of them in heels. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, we'll do one more here, and then and then we'll let you free. If you're hanging out in a, you know, a social group and uh, just talking, hanging out, 
people have e-cigs nowadays, but you know, there's always been cigarettes around. Would you rather the people around you be smoking cigarettes or hitting e-cigs? Probably none of it. No, neither? I mean, I still smoke cigarettes and I should have. Yeah. But, uh... Doesn't matter either way. I just love the facial expressions I'm getting off you asking these questions. No, it's just, you know, I understand part of uh -huh. this, you know, I understand part of it. The, the, the craze is uh -huh. pretty hilarious. Yeah, yeah. I Absolutely. I won't, I won't be too specific about that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Well, Charlie, seriously, man, I, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day to do this for us. Uh, sure. We seriously, seriously appreciate it. And um, it was amazing just to get to hear some of the stuff from you directly. And uh, I hope everyone else enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Well, it's good to, always good to be South Boston Music. Absolutely, Charlie. Thank, thank you so much, man. Thank you.